Hi, my name is Ryan and I'm a Chartered Building Services Engineer and I've had many years of experience putting together great energy strategies for new builds. And I'm going to lay out a process that I work with with my clients and it's a simple and easy process to follow to develop a great energy strategy. So why is it important to develop an energy strategy early on? Well, it, depending on what decisions you choose, what sort of heat sources you're going to take, if you're going to go for PVs or not, what other sort of technologies you're going to use, will have a knock-on effect on what sort of plant space you need and how the building is going to operate. So it's always good to start thinking about this early on. So the motivation for doing it, well mainly it is to try and reduce running costs. Um, the, generally the more money you invest early on in the build, the lower the running costs later on. And also the more importantly is CO2. Generally, if we can try and reduce as much energy consumption within the building, the less CO2 we are going to emit, and it will be overall better for the overall environment. So I'm going to quickly run through the process. So if that's something of interest to you, please watch on. Thank you. So before we get started, the first thing you need to think about is budget. What are you prepared to pay over and above what building regulations ask for? So firstly, I need to stress that building regulations is a bare minimum, and it shouldn't actually be considered a uh, reasonable target. No new building should really be aimed at just meeting building regulation. So it's very important to get that also in your mind firstly. So once you've got a budget in mind, that will take it, that will affect what the decisions you take later on in the process. But the first decision is adopting the fabric first principles. So generally, the more money you spend on your fabric, the less energy you're going to use in terms of your heating. So there are many options out there. I'm not an expert on building fabric as a whole. It's best to ask your architect for the type of options there are. There are options of triple glazing. There are options of recycled material. The, the key thing is to think about U-value. It's the amount of energy that gets lost through the wall. The lower the U-value, the better. One other key thing you should start asking if you're very green in minded is to think about also embodied carbon as well. That is yet not in building regulations at all but it's something to start thinking about um, how you want to and what sort of energy you want to embed into your property. So once you've got your fabric down and are organized with your architect normally sort of around about 25 to 30 percent over and above what's required for building regulations we can then move on to the next step. So step two is to define your available PV array area. I go straight in there with PVs because they are one of the best renewables out on the market and they can reduce your carbon footprint quite substantially. They do provide one of the best sort of return on investments in terms of pounds invested on capital cost for amount of CO2 save. They also will save you money throughout the building lifespan as well. So what are your options? I'm going to go through a few PV array options. So the first option is these ones behind me are built into the roof structure itself. They, they look a lot better than the sort of stereotypical ones you see nowadays that have been bolted on existing roofs. So secondly, if you're a home user, you might think about using a Tesla wall battery and there are other options we'll go through in a minute. The advantage of the Tesla wall battery is that the energy will be generated during the day when you're not in and not using a lot of energy and then will be stored in your battery to then be used when you come back from work. The other option is to use a slate or tile method. Tesla have got a lot of press recently about their option. We're not 100% sure when that's coming in, but currently there are other manufacturers on the market that use like solar slate or a, a pretty much a normal tile and then they put the PV panel on top of that which as you can see is what they've installed above here. So a little bit closer look. This is the normal tile. They put the PV panel on there and then behind that there's just an electrical connection. So the actual sort of end result looks pretty cool. The actual cost of it, I'm not sure what the difference is, but when I was here last they said it was almost the same price as if you were paying for a normal tile with a, also a PV array. One thing you gotta know about a normal typical Tesla setup is that it can't be used as a backup battery. So if the power goes out in your home, your battery can't be used. There are other manufacturers out in the market now that are starting to put in switchovers that allows you to have a backup supply within your home. So those are the, some of the options you have with PVs. And I say available area because you need to just think about 
trimming that area later on through the design process. It's important that you don't want too big a PV panel array because um, you might be investing too much money into something you don't actually use. You're only really helping yourself if you're using it, but you are helping the grid as well. You've also got to check that you've got enough um, as capacity in the local area to take your excess power as well. So that's important to tell or ask the local supply. Generally not a problem if you're staying sort of domestic scale or uh, four kilowatts. So once you've got the PV array sorted, let's move on to your main heat source. So now you've got a much better understanding of what size PV array you can fit on your roof and what type it is going to be and how much it's going to cost. From that, you can then ask yourself what is left in your budget to further reduce your carbon footprint. Typically, this is either spent on improving your building fabric even more or replacing the main heat source with a low carbon technology. So what are the three main low carbon technologies available for sort of new builds? Mainly air source heat pump, ground source heat pump, and biomass. With biomass, we would only really recommend to be used on multi-residential developments or large commercial developments. So if you're a small to medium sized project, then you really only have two options, either a ground source heat pump or an air source heat pump. And normally the one that stops you using ground source is the budget. So you need to roughly budget in at least 30 grand for a ground source heat pump. So if that doesn't meet with your available budget, then that means that rules that one out. With the air source heat pump, that normally leaves that air source heat pump is the main preferred option. So I'm going to, the main advantage of using an air source heat pump or a ground source heat pump is that actually you don't need to have gas on site. You can just use the electricity supply. This has huge advantages, mainly because you don't need to deal with another utility supplier. Um, you also don't need to pay for another meter. And also, you know, it's just bringing gas onto site can be laborious and also can be sometimes a little bit dangerous as well in terms of its risk in, on, on the sort of site and dealing with how, how that arrange, is arranged for it. However, the advantages of having an air source heat pump and only having electricity on site get diminished if you want to have gas cooking. We try and discourage gas cooking for many reasons, but uh, we, also, we prefer um, electric induction hobs, uh, so much uh, greener and also easier for ventilation as well. That's uh, another topic altogether where we're talking about energy for this particular video. If you are still going to have a gas supply brought to site, go through the meter application and go through all that process, the actual benefit actually putting in an air source heat pump against um, a gas combi boiler is normally relatively marginal. So if you've got a great building fabric installed, if you're going to have PV installed, the actual benefit actually putting in a, uh, an air source heat pump compared to a combi boiler is relatively marginal, mainly because air source heat pumps aren't great at providing hot water. The main advantage is on the heating and also being able to, it also further helps with the compliance side. But in reality, the difference isn't dramatic. So if you want to still use gas cooking, we probably still recommend you to still use a traditional gas boiler just because you paid all that money to bring on gas onto site and uh, it allows you the greatest flexibility as well. But if you want to still use uh, electric cooking, please hang on and uh, we'll explain a little bit more about what, uh, how, how a ground source, uh, ground source and an air source heat pump system works so you understand a little bit better what you're going to be getting. But if you're now set on gas, Please feel free, if you have any questions, please feel free to get in contact with me. I'd be more than happy to explain um, any sort of questions and answer any questions. Um, also, you can use the remaining money either as a contingency or actually still go back and um, improve your building fabric. So I'm going to go quickly through what an air source heat pump is and what a ground source heat pump is and what's the difference. And why would you not go for a ground source and why would you go for an air source or vice versa. So firstly, a ground source heat pump is better hands down than an air source heat pump. The only reason why these are more popular is because of budget. The biggest cost for a ground source heat pump is the ground works. So with the ground works, there are two options. You can either go horizontal or borehole. Horizontal, either literally digging a hole, filling it with, uh, literally it is going to look like garden hose, and then filling it up again. And that's quite expensive over uh, for most, most properties. Unless you're willing to do the work yourself, generally that's pretty much cost prohibitive. 
on large projects where you can get boreholes or get economy of scale, then the ground source heat pump can be very beneficial. And also if you have different types of loads. So it's very important if you are doing large commercial developments to get a decent energy model put together so you can understand better where energy flows in your building. So moving on to what an air source seat pump is and what a ground source seat pump is. So they are effectively the same technology, just the air, energy comes from air or ground. The air gets sucked into the unit here, then energy gets sucked out of it using a compressor, which is pretty much the same thing as what you'd use on a sort of fridge, but it's in reverse. So once you've got that, it goes into a hot water cylinder, and it powers the hot water cylinder, and that's where you get your hot water from. It also then is used for your underfloor heating or your radiators. We would normally recommend air source heat pumps with underfloor heating, mainly because uh, they are very compatible with each other. On modern day buildings, it means if you went for a radiator, they would be slightly oversized than if you had a normal typical radiator. On refurbishment buildings that aren't that great, have a high heat loss, I would not recommend it. It means your radiators will be looking pretty stupidly large. So. You do still get RHI payments, which is the Renewable Heat Incentive Payments. Um, so every kilowatt of energy or energy you generate through that and put into your heating system, the government will pay or Ofcom will pay you a, a proportion. Please check the Ofcom's website. Um, that changes all the time. So once you've selected the, either a ground source heat pump or an air source heat pump, that is pretty much it. There isn't that much other sort of options. We've covered why you wouldn't use a, um, a biomass boiler. And we covered most of the other technology. So you, to recap, you would have selected what sort of building fabric you want. You would have asked the architect what's the best sort of um, e-values you can get for your budget or, or what you want to get out of it. And then you'd go and look at what sort of PV panel array you can afford or put on the roof. Generally, that's normally the limiting factor is what a usable area there is. And then once you've done that, you then look at, do I want a battery or do I not want a battery? It's all depending on what type of, um, type of uh, building you're going to use. And then moved on to what sort of heat source you're going to use. So generally, bottom line is either it's going to be a ground source or an air source heat pump, provided that you don't want gas cooking. If you want gas cooking, then you probably would have stuck with a gas combi boiler or a gas system boiler. So I hope you found that useful. If you have any questions, please feel free to get in contact with me. I have some great guides as well on each of the technologies mentioned as well. So please feel free to ask for them as well. Um, and yeah, thank you for watching this video.